Okay. So yesterday we discussed the graph theory framework in the Wolfram language. Uh, we explored some of the ways of representing graphs, constructing graphs that are available in the Wolfram language. Uh, and we also discussed various functions that are used for graph analysis, certain measures of centrality uh, or connectivity within a graph. Um, and today, in addition to the sort of introductory problems that uh, I presented uh, yesterday that were included in the first lecture notebook, uh, today we're also going to be exploring uh, some more real world problems. So we are going to be using the tools that we uh, developed yesterday uh, to, uh, you know, sort of explore real world issues that can be solved with the tools available in the Wolfram language. Uh, and we're going to be doing that during the first half of uh, this lecture today. Uh, so basically I'm going to introduce these problems and then the first half of the lecture uh, session we are going to use just to, you, know, you can all work on that on your own and I will be available for any questions. Uh, if there's anything that comes up, I will try and make it, uh, I will try and present it to the whole group if I think it would be valuable for everybody to know. Um, and then in the second half of the lecture, we are going to be uh, beginning a new topic of visualization in the Wolfram language. <clears throat> so, uh, just a moment, and I will start presenting the uh, problems. All right, so uh, the first, uh, exploration, the first problem, is made up of several parts, and it's focused on this concept of centrality measures. If you remember the lecture yesterday, we explored the Medici family in the politics of, uh, of Renaissance Italy, and you know, the reason they were so influential and powerful was because they happened to be positioned politically uh, with a measure of high centrality in the various uh, ruling families. And so because they were central, not necessarily because they had the most resources. Uh, they were central to the, uh, the graph of all of the individual families. They were able to be uh, effective and influential. So what we're going to be doing uh, today is we're going to be taking uh, websites uh, and exploring basically how uh, they are connected to each other based on page rank centrality. Um, you may be familiar with the page rank algorithm as a way of measuring know how important a website is for a given search term. <clears throat> and so the first problem is just going to, or the first set of problems, uh, they are all kind of connected to each other, is going to be talking about analyzing websites using these measures of centrality and particularly the page rank centrality. Um, and so basically we're just going to be using the tools of the Wolfram language and you know in any cases where the tools are not you know, totally obvious, if it's not something that is uh, you know, like a, a for loop or something very obvious uh, from a programming perspective, there will be little hints indicating, you know, what you can do in order to get started. Uh, for instance, using import. Uh, the function import allows you to uh, obtain various uh, properties from an imported uh, expression, be it a file or be it a web page. And, you know, selecting the most visible page and capturing part of the page, well, how do you do that? And the hint is helpful enough to let you know that there is, in fact, a function web image that will allow you to do this. Uh, similarly, for uh, measures of centrality, the uh, next two pieces of this uh, problem deal with the United States power grid, uh, specifically the Western United States power grid. Uh, and the measures of centrality in this, uh, in this grid are going to be useful for understanding, you know, how important certain nodes are to the power grid. <clears throat> and so you're going to be exploring that. Uh, and as the second chunk of the uh, explorations, we are going to be exploring a different real world domain, which is finance. <clears throat> The Wolfram language has a large amount of built-in financial data. And in fact, you can use the function financial data to obtain information. <clears throat> so this, this may be not entirely uh, clear what it means, but if you go to the documentation page for financial data, it has the basic uh, syntax necessary for using the function, as well as some introductory examples that explain how this is all supposed to work. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of uh, stock values and we're going to be looking at how they are correlated with each other. 
Uh, so basically, we're going to see how strongly correlated the values of certain stocks are over time and uh, use that to draw graphs or graph edges between companies if they are uh, strongly correlated beyond some certain threshold value. <clears throat> and so we are going to be using, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the market and we're going to see what uh, what companies are connected with each other, what stock values are connected with each other beyond certain threshold or above, above certain thresholds or below certain thresholds. And we're going to be using that to see uh, how well these stocks perform, relatively speaking. Uh, and so that is going to be uh, what we're going to be working on for uh, the next few minutes. I am going to put this notebook into the Slack channel and all of you should be able to download it from there and uh, then we, you, know, you can all work on that in your groups and please let me know if you have any questions. Just one moment while I get this notebook attached. All right, so this is the uh, second lecture that will, uh, that will make up this uh, topic. <clears throat> that will make up this course in Mathematica. So the first topic, we talked about graphs and various ways of measuring and, and visualizing graphs. Uh, for the second uh, half of the series, we are going to be talking about data visualization. Um, many of you are working in physics. Many of you probably encountered many different kinds of visualization in papers and, uh, and research materials. Uh, and so basically, we, we are going to be exploring all of the various ways that the Wolfram language can be used to represent and visualize data. <clears throat> so uh, basically, we have many, 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 many different kinds of data that we would like to visualize. And so the Wolfram language has many different kinds of visualization function. Um, so we have numbers of uh, various dimensions. We have you know, two, two, three, four dimensional vectors, and we might want to visualize those. We might have categorical uh, data where you know, some set of things falls into a particular set of categories. Uh, we have functions for dealing with uh, geographical locations or dates. Um, and so basically we want to explore all of the different ways we have to really effectively demonstrate uh, this data. And you know, it, this is partially an art. This is something where there isn't always a single best way to visualize data. Sometimes a, a particularly, uh, an unusual or unexpected method of visualization could be very illuminating. Um, so this is an art, uh, but we're going to be exploring some of the options that are available in the Wolfram language. <clears throat> so as a, as a short list of the things that we're going to be exploring, we are going to be exploring scatter plots. We've got charts and histograms. Uh, the Wolfram language handles uh, time series, so specifically data that uh, is associated with a particular uh, time, such as stocks, uh, just tables or grids or anything like that. And also geographic visualizations, which have been in the Wolfram language for a few versions and allow you to actually plot uh, data on top of a real world map. So uh, the example that we're going to be exploring in this first, uh, first notebook is the United States uh, baby names. So baby names popularity. Uh, and basically this is data that can be obtained from the Wolfram data repository. This is also present in uh, the lecture notebook and I am going to be putting that in the Slack and then hitting return if I remember, uh, remember to do so this time. Uh, so this data is very large. And so rather than evaluating it or rather than importing it from the resource uh, data function, uh, it's actually included in the lecture. Uh, so we can evaluate some initialization cells. I'll actually show you where those are. So right at the end of the notebook, there are these sort of gray highlighted uh, cells and these are a convenient way of including information uh, that you don't necessarily want to put at the front of a notebook if you're creating a presentation that's reliant on some code and you don't want to have that code uh, busying up 
your uh, your lecture notes. So you can just put everything in the in there at the end, make it an initialization cell. So you can make it an initialization cell like that. And then just whenever somebody evaluates something in the notebook, it'll automatically evaluate the initialization cells beforehand. And so you can see that if I actually do try to import it from the repository, it is 269 megabytes and it's quite large, uh, which is why the data, which is why some of the data is included in the lecture notes, I should say. It's not the entire thing. So the raw data that we have uh, consists of a geolocation, uh, a categorical gender, date, uh, a category for name, and value, the number of people. So there is a uh, the category of names, there are, there are multiple people who are named Mary. Um, and you know, that is a, that is a sort of a distinct, uh, and discrete, uh, way of categorizing data. So we have many different pieces of information that we might want to display in various different ways, all coming from this one data set. <clears throat> I should have evaluated this beforehand. Oh well. Let's take a quick one minute break while this uh, this finishes downloading. Uh, data repository, uh, okay, thank you very much. Now that the data has finished downloading from the uh, data repository, we can continue. We can see that there are over 5 million uh, pieces of data included in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this data repository. So what is in there? Let's take a look at that. Syndicates it's still thinking about it. Don't know why it's still thinking about it. All right, let's ignore the random sample. There we go. Okay. So this is the format in which this uh, data was given to us. We can see that there's a state, gender, year, name, number. Uh, so, this expression here is a data set in the Wolfram language. You can see by investigating the head of the expression that it has head data set. Um, so this is a, it's basically a little wrapper for various types of data. It's a nested structure consisting of lists and associations. So lists are, you know, sort of enumerable. They're intended to be accessed uh, via the index of an expression. So if I have a list, The first part of the list, part one, is one. Whereas an association, another kind of expression in the Wolfram language, is intended to be accessed via keys. It's that's uh, if you're familiar with C plus plus, it's a little bit like an enum table or something like that. An enumerable set. Of, uh, of categorical expressions that are not necessarily in any particular order. 
So if I get, have an association, I can then access elements of the association by their keys. And uh, so if you have a nested list of you know, some associations, some lists, uh, some combination of things, the, uh, a data set is a natural way of representing all of that uh, information. And basically, the Wolfram language will sort of automatically generate uh, a nice set of boxes that will display all of that information simultaneously. And sometimes it'll it'll uh, compress things if uh, if there's too much material in a given cell. Um, but basically, it's just a very convenient way to automatically handle all of this information. Mm. Uh, rather than, and we can convert it back to an ordinary uh, set of associations and list with the function normal. In fact, there are a large number of uh, expressions in the Wolfram language that are um, given little icons or wrappers or something like that. And normal will always convert it back to a normal expression, a, a list of associations, something that's very normal and expected in the core of the Wolfram language. And so you can see right here that the output of normal of this expression here is a list of associations with keys, state, gender, year, name, and number. And there we go. And uh, in case you're ever dealing with anything involving large uh, amounts of data, the function quit, which is equivalent to taking the uh, menu item evaluation quit kernel, that'll just clear everything. There are a number of other ways of uh, clearing the uh, memory of, the Wolfram, of your Wolfram kernel session, but this is the most Straightforward. Well, that's not good. So moving on. <clears throat> uh, sometimes, rather than this fancy nested data set structure, you may just want to put things in a grid. So I've got grid values. I've got a list of lists. I may want to put some uh, headers in there, and I may want to just make a grid. Yeah. Also, these little brackets at the side indicate that something is currently evaluating. I believe that the, uh, oh, there we go. The initialization cells at the back of the uh, notebook were evaluating, and those, that was holding up the evaluation here. Uh, so, okay, so I've got some grid values, grid headers. I just want to put them in a grid. I can also make it so that the uh, grid has lines. Oh, dividers, that's the, uh, that's the option, not grid lines. Dividers is the appropriate option name. All right, and uh, it, for those of you who use LaTeX frequently, um, there is a built-in function in the Wolfram language, techform, which allows you to convert uh, many expressions to uh, the appropriate uh, tech or LaTeX equivalent. So I can just convert this grid to uh, to tech form. And then you can copy this and paste it in some, uh, some LaTeX document that you might be working with. All right, so let's take some information. Uh, so we've got this data in here. We take a random sample. Uh, this is taken from the uh, top 50 names per year. Uh, and so I've just taken the top three most popular names uh, for a random sample of years. Uh, so in 2008, the name Jacob was very popular. Gosh, what, uh, what was coming out in 2008 that might make people want to name, name their children Jacob? Um, and then we've got uh, the name Michael, the name James, perennial favorites. And so we've got the 
normal function, which converts any data set information to just lists and associations. And then we have the function short, which is extremely convenient because it'll automatically truncate anything that's too uh, long to display on the screen. It won't affect evaluation in any way. It'll just uh, prevent, prevent the front end from trying to render an extremely large data set or extremely long list. So in here, uh, stripping out the ranks over the years, I don't know why. Okay. I, oh yes, I suppose the uh, the data is not including. Uh, this doesn't include information about years after the data set itself was produced. So in the year nineteen ten. Mary in 1911 and 1912, Mary was the most popular name. So, no, I'm sorry. Yes, the ranks, okay. So we can see that the, in 1910, Mary was the number one most popular name. This, main, this was uh, maintained for a while. And so we can see how Mary and John, how their relative ranks in the lists of most popular names have changed over time. Uh, so we can see that in the 1920s, Mary and John were both pretty close to the number one uh, top names. And we can just use the function list plot and that will display all of these numbers that are present in these uh, in these uh, lists. And so yeah, so if we have something like a year uh, and a number, list plot makes a lot of sense for plotting the values of the elements in a list. So list plot is a natural one. Uh, similarly, we have list log plot, which will display the y-axis uh, as a logarithmic axis. Uh, so we have a, a better degree of uh, a visualization for uh, you know, lower uh, quantities, just so the y-axis doesn't get blown up. Similarly, there is list line plot, which will automatically draw lines in between the, uh, the different points and just make a continuous line rather than a series of uh, distinct points. It doesn't really present the information any differently, but uh, maybe your journal has particular style standards for how they want uh, things presented. Similarly, list step plot uh, will do something similar, except everything will be a step rather than a straight line. So you can see that uh, here there is a little jump, and I'm actually going to blow that up. So we see that rather than a smooth increase uh, in the value of the, uh, the function, there is just a jump, a distinct jump. I don't know for what situations this would be uh, more useful than list line plot or list plot, but the point being that there are a wide range of built-in visualization functions for particular applications. There is so much stuff already built in to the Wolfram language. <clears throat> so I don't personally know what you might use list step plot for, but I'm, I'm quite confident that there is some field out there that really loves list step plot, and that is why we have this. Um, all right. And so here we can take a, a look at uh, how many uh, people of various genders were born uh, in each year. This is uh, highlighting a particular feature of the Wolfram language that the Wolfram language has units in it. Now, as I was saying before that there are some expressions that have little wrappers in them, but which are in fact ordinary Wolfram language expressions. I was talking about this before in the context of normal uh, and data set, but it's also true of these weird little brown expressions where you hover over them and they tell you a unit. You can see that this is in fact an ordinary Wolfram language expression with a head quantity, uh, first argument of a number, and a second argument of a category. Much of, much of the information that is returned uh, by the built-in functions of the Wolfram language that return real-world data will do so in terms of a quantity or something like this, which is a date expression, or rather a date, a date object. 
So all of these funny little iconized things are in fact ordinary Wolfram language expressions. So we can see that the structure of this data is a nested association. So we have a year and we have categories, the, uh, the keys of which are female and male, and the values of which are uh, numbers of people with units of people. So I mentioned previously that we have functions date list plot that display information based on uh, dates. They're ideal for analyzing data that varies over time, as opposed to with some other variable. So we can see some of this data just by itself. And now we can see how it's represented by different visualization functions. So date list plot and date list log plot just display the number of female and male people born in the US over time in any given year. And so you can sort of see uh, there we've got uh, people going off to World War II and coming back. And there's the baby boom right there. And so you can sort of see that just in this very basic visualization. We've got date list plot, which just displays the numbers of our quantities over time. We've got date list log plot, which does the same thing on a logarithmic axis. We've got date list step plot, which just does this at discrete steps. And we've also got stacked date list plot. So if you have uh, several sources of categorical, uh, categorical data, but you might also be interested in viewing the total uh, simultaneously, you can display your data sort of stacked on top of each other. So what this top curve essentially represents is the combined total birth rate. Uh, and this one indicates, uh, and these two sub chunks indicate a uh, breakdown of birth by gender. So, okay, so we've got list plot for just plotting numbers that vary, you know, some two-dimensional uh, two set of uh, data points. We've got date list plot, which is specifically designed for uh, working with dates as the independent variable. We've also got timeline plot. So timeline plot allows you to identify and display uh, events on a timeline. So we can see here that the x-axis is time and the y-axis is categorical. So we are handling uh, events rather than uh, numerical data points. So we can use this to display when a name was most popular. <clears throat> so in this, uh, in, this in this time period from 1910 to 1930, Mary was the most popular name. And so we can see all of the periods in which these categorical names were the most popular. So if we have uh, an independent x-axis, which is time, and an output, which is categorical, this is a natural function to display that. <clears throat> and you can also do this for things like project management. You can just say, OK, well, during what period of time do we plan to be involved in uh, a certain project? If we have something that requires uh, you know, all these pieces to come together during what time periods are we going to be working on them? Uh, and that is another way that you can use the Wolfram language for, uh, for dealing with projects. All right. Another way of categorical representation is pie charts and bar charts. So again, we're just looking at all of this information. Um, we've got uh, names that uh, that are part of, uh, that do not have a, a gender associated with them. Alexander, Inez, Rodolfo are all uh, used by my people of all genders. Uh, and so we can count what fraction of the number of people born in a particular year with a particular name at a given gender. And so pie charts and bar charts should not be particularly surprising. But we can see, again, with categorical data, we can see that what fraction of the people born, uh, 
here were of a particular name. So we can see how this breaks down by popularity and then everything else is just to be an other. <clears throat> and pie charts should be pretty familiar. Um, we can also see how different sample sizes might be put together to create sort of combined pie charts. And we can do that in 3D as well. Um, it's all very fancy. I think this example is a little contrived, frankly. Um, but know that, the know that the example is there. Uh, you can compare different population sizes uh, for the same categorical data, and you can display those two different things together uh, on the same chart, on the same pie chart. <clears throat> Although I think for this kind of example, a bar chart or a stacked bar chart would be more appropriate. <clears throat> And so let's see what that looks like. A bar chart or a stacked bar chart to indicate the relative popularity of these names without having that big chunk of the uh, pie chart needing to be dedicated to other. So we can just say that you know everything else pa out here past this, uh, this part of the tail that we've chopped off, that's other. And But we don't have to visualize it because we're using a bar chart instead of a pie chart. So it's the same visual, it's the same information, but presented in, I think, a more natural way. <clears throat> so we've got bar chart and bar chart 3D. Uh, and bar chart 3D will actually allow you to use uh, the information uh, in a full, in a full three-dimensional way. You can have multiple sets of, oops. You can have multiple sets of bars stacked up behind each other. You can display uh, bar chart information in a full three-dimensional way uh, using bar chart 3D. And so you can also do paired bar charts. You can display categorical information from two different sources along with an axis up against each other. Again, it's just one of those things that, you know, enough people wanted it, enough people use it for their, for their particular application that we have it built in in the Wolfram language. Uh, so we've also got rectangle chart. Uh, I don't know why you would use this, but it's here. There are a lot of visualization functions in the Wolfram language, which is my core point. Uh, histograms, I hope you were familiar with histograms. And so we can compare uh, how many uh, or how many names have a particular length, or we can see the distribution of how many names have a particular length. We can see that most names uh, in this database have about six letters on average. Uh, the majority, or well, a, a plurality, the most have uh, six letters in them. And we can see how the distribution goes all the way up to 14 plus, 14, uh, four names listed in our database have 14, plus, uh, 14 letters. And so, uh, as you might notice here, uh, the function string length is built into the Wolfram language. Uh, and we, it'll, that, that'll just tell you how long a string is. That's it, nothing fancy. And just like we had a paired bar chart, we also have a paired histogram, which allows you to compare uh, histograms from two different populations with different population sizes. And similarly, if your x-axis is not a categorical string length, but rather a date, then there is going to be a date histogram that you can use for that. Hold on. Oh. I don't know why that's chugging. It's chugging. There we go.
There we go. So we can see how uh, the frequency with which certain names occurred in given years. And we can again plot that as a histogram, but because the data, uh, because the independent variable is time, it's much uh, more natural to plot it as a date histogram rather than a regular histogram. Mm. We can also take that year and we can just convert it to a number so we can use it in our ordinary histogram functions. We also have a smooth histogram. Um, and what that does is it converts a histogram to a uh, PDF or it displays it as a, as, the, as a PDF will be displayed. All right. And here's one of the fancy ones that people like to bring out for uh, demonstrations, word cloud. So basically we can take uh, a whole bunch of uh, names, we can see how frequently they occur and we can display them uh, in a cloud with their size dependent on how frequently they occur. So we can see that this is the data that is going to go into the word cloud as soon as it is ready. And we can anticipate, there we go. So that the names John, Michael, James, Robert, William, David, and Mary are all very popular. Joseph, Richard, Donna, Dennis, Jordan, Ethan, Ruth, Amy. Um, yeah, it's a cute visualization feature. Sometimes it can be quite useful. Um, if you want to do text analysis, you can remove stop words and you can see how many times uh, given words pop up in a given piece of text. Uh, and breaking it down with a word cloud gives you a, an immediate first impression of the text. You can actually identify text by author uh, in some cases if, you, if you're familiar with the author's work and you have a, a word cloud in which the suitable stop words have been deleted. It can be, it can be quite uh, useful in some cases. Hmm. And I mentioned previously uh, the geographical visualization. So if we pick some names, we can see that in a particular state, we got a particular number of people with a given name. So what is the, the distribution of a particular name uh, look like? Distribution of a particular name look like with geography. Uh, there are a wide range of built-in geographical visualization function. That's not good. All right, well, geographics appears to be working all right. I'm just going to quit real quick. Something has gone wrong. Well, I suppose the takeaway from this is that there are functions built in to do uh, geographical visualization. You can see uh, where names are popular. You can also uh, plot uh, with a sort of a bubble chart. You can plot a, you can see a map with the various locations uh, displayed on it. And there's a bubble on each one, the size of which indicates how many people uh, had a given name in that state. Hmm. Again, really the takeaway from this is that there are a wide number of built-in visualization uh, functions in the Wolfram language. 
to display a wide range of data types. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, so we can see uh, here are the, uh, here are a number of different uh, ways that we can see uh, how names are, are uh, distributed in the United States. So we can see what states and uh, names were least popular. We can see uh, in what states, uh, what states had the most names in a particular year as a histogram. We can visualize that as a bubble chart or sort of a heat map. There are a wide range of visualization functions, and here are some of them. Uh, there are a bunch of others listed here just for uh, various other data types, 1D data, 2D data, matrices, graphs, or financial data. Uh, and these are all just listed. Uh, and it links, there are links in this notebook to uh, various documentation pages that discuss this in more detail. There are also a couple of review exercises in here, which I hope you will all work on together.